so nice to have you back, Gilbert, on this podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you. Let's get started with Anthony Blinken's visit to Kiev. Do we know what's the latest strategy of the United States together with its European con- European allies in order to deal with Russia in Ukraine? Well, I think we can guess. So let's be honest about it. We are guessing. But I think these are very well-informed guesses. And what he's doing there is most likely uh, conveying to Kiev the decision that's been jointly reached between the United States and the United Kingdom to allow the, the, the Ukrainians to use the missiles and other long distance weapon systems that the uh, United States, Britain, Germany, France, and, and NATO countries have delivered to Ukraine to allow them to use this to strike deep into the Russian heartland. Uh, and this is explained in various ways, they, uh, but the main, the main driver of this is the present situation in the war which is very unfavorable for Kiev and therefore very unca- unfavorable for Kiev's backers in the United States and in the West generally. Um, I, what he's, he's, he's doing that, uh, he's informing um, the, um, the, the Ukrainian leadership that they have this permission. And in two days time, uh, the British Prime Minister, Starmer will be, in, as I understand the timing, will be in Washington meeting with Mr. Uh, uh, Biden to uh, discuss this very thing. If assuming that Mr. Biden is surrounded by some of his curators, shall we say, so th- so the message is properly received by the U.S. leadership. Um, it's it is really quite quite a, a, a parallel here. What we're seeing before our eyes with what we had bef- uh, before the outbreak of the American-led attack on Iraq. That is, you know, uh, yet again. A British uh, Labour government is uh, is working hand in glove with the American administration to perpetrate uh, war crimes and to kill millions of people. This this is what we're about to see, unfortunately. And this time, some of those killed will not be uh, unfortunates in Iraq, but will be people right here in Europe. And possibly, if this continues to its logical uh, extension right in the United States. We're talking about the, the imminent outbreak of World War III. And that is what Mr. Uh, Mr. Blinken is doing in Kiev. He's setting the stage. And that is what Mr. Biden and Mr. Starmer will be doing in Washington, setting the stage for the outbreak of World War III before the November elections. And do you think that they're going to give the permission to Zelensky recently was talking about long range missiles and receiving some sort of permission to attack Russia deep into the Russian territory. Do you think Zelensky is going to get it with the current type of policy that Washington, it, it seems that they're, they want to do that. Do you? But do you think that at the end of the day, they would do that with Zelensky? Well, it seemed most improbable. And uh, I, I, but then again, every time the United States um, flip-flops, and crosses red lines, which it had itself set out. It does that at a moment where the situation is adverse in the Ukraine conflict and where many of us uh, in, uh, in this media and alternative media have been discussing the likely Russian victory or the likely negotiations for a, for a ceasefire and, and a settlement to the war given the fact that the Russians have been doing very well and the Ukrainians have been doing very poorly and should face up to the facts, to all the conclusions and sue for peace. And each time we uh, observers have been proven wrong, not because we're stupid or blind or whatever, but because it was inconceivable that the United States would proceed in a still more reckless way on uh, on the path to World War III And here we are, we're up against the last red line, and they're blithely crossing it. Uh, Mr. Lavrov, Mr. Putin, in the last two weeks, have made explicitly clear that the United States is playing with matches, at least with a term that Mr. Lavrov used, 
what he had in mind was precisely what we're talking about this at this moment, uh, providing um, uh, the Ukrainians with the right, the authorization to use the weapons uh, to hit the heartland. The cover for this, the explanation, which uh, which is repeated, but it's drafted by the State Department. It is um, it is copied by uh, by all the major media. The explanation is that yes, the Russians are using bases far back from the line of confrontation in their own territory to um, direct missile strikes, drone strikes against uh, Ukraine, which are causing uh, great civilian damage and loss of life and so forth. I won't get into the question of loss of life uh, or the, what, what the nature of the damage is, because this is indisputable that the damage has been military targets and or infrastructure supporting the military in Ukraine. And every time that we hear that a civilian um, uh, structure, building, uh, hotel, um, hospital, Lord knows what, has been hit by a Russian missile, there's always been a sound explanation that these were a cover for mi purely military use. In the case of the, of the um, Poltava uh, Military Communications Institute is a case in point because that was first announced to have been a civilian object, and then even the, the Ukrainians admitted that it was a military center. They had no choice because there were 700 dead soldiers and officers, many of them NATO instructors, who, who were victims of that attack. And so to call it um, a, um, a civilian or innocent um, training center was, was a total, total lie that was caught out. In any case, the, uh, these, uh, these uh, are excuses for the United States and its allies, closest ally being Britain, um, preparing to attack Russia in its, in, its, in its interior in a more severe way than, that, than Ukraine has been doing. Let us not say that Ukraine has been sitting on its hands. We know that, that uh, two or three days ago, they, uh, one of their long-range um, drones, a, um, which is an, was an, uh, an aircraft type of drone, not a helicopter, but a, an aircraft type of, um, a, an airplane type of drone carrying 50 kilograms of explosives, hit a, um, an apartment building in the Moscow, Moscow Oblast, which is, this is a suburb, a rather built up suburb of the city of Moscow. Then there was one, one woman died. The, the, the images on television carried also by the West showed uh, extensive damage to a, an apartment building, uh, which was struck in the middle of the night so that they, they could have maximum loss of life and, and injuries. Um, that is the, what the, the long range missiles will be used for. And why? Because the Russians have taken back as far as possible their uh, aircraft and um, coordination centers beyond the reach of the, um, the um, uh, missiles, this is a storm shadow or scalp, uh, which, um, had, which the Ukrainians had received thus far. Um, and therefore, the possibility of the Ukrainians doing what Mr. Zelensky said um, and uh, um, curbing the attacks on, on his country by striking at the, air, at the, at the airplanes carrying these these weapons. That was completely empty talk. Um, only only um, the most ignorant um, readers of the New York Times or whatever would believe that claptrap. Um, what he had in mind was terror. And that's what this missile, uh, that this uh, drone strike was all about in the suburb of Moscow. It is to create terror, terror in the Russian civilian population, hoping to split uh, the population away from the, the, uh, the government and to achieve the, the regime change, which going back before February 2022 um, was really and remains the objective of the United States, regime change in Moscow. So the missiles would be used not for the ostensible reason of improving Ukraine's defense um, or, or against Russian, Russian air attack, but for the different purpose of regime change through creating havoc and terror 
in Russian civil society. That is unacceptable. As I said a moment ago, Mr. Lavrov and Mr. Putin have said that this is something that will trigger a response that is unequivocal, and that will be a counterattack. Now, a counterattack is probably what Washington wants right now. Um, because then you would have a full-blown war, and that's what they're seeking. Uh, if there's a full-blown war, then Kamala will be elected easily because uh, there'll be a rally around the flag, um, upsurge of patriotism in the States, and uh, the horror of uh, Mr. Trump coming to power will have been avoided. Uh, all of this is logical all of, uh, if, if, you, if you are suffering from some kind of insanity. It is, a, uh, it is an insane foreign policy and military policy. But regrettably, uh, what, I, what I have called in an essay uh, published last night, uh, the collective Biden, that is the curators of Mr. Biden, since he slipped into senility, uh, have agreed that this uh, policy, risking the extinction of, of, of our human race on Earth, is acceptable. And so it, it sounds, it sounds uh, really incredible. And so this is why we have not, we observers have not factored this into what we have been saying about the course of the war. If you were reading my, my peers uh, or watching on YouTube, uh, the most visible uh, analysts of the ongoing war, the ones who have the, the, the ratings like your own, 60, 70, 150,000 view, views of any uh, interview they give, they almost all have been saying the same thing. The end of Ukraine is nigh. The, um, the Russians are coming through like a steamroller. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the collapse of, of Kiev is, is a matter of days. Maybe the collapse of NATO will follow two, two weeks later. Well, this was a little bit jubilant, and I'd say... Um, um, overdone, but nonetheless, the basic notion uh, was founded in facts that um, uh, the the Ukrainians have been bearing in, uh, unacceptable, impossible daily losses of two thousand and more soldiers a day. That's on the main conf line of confrontation, plus four or five hundred a day within the Kursk salient that they opened when they made their raid a month ago into this border. Uh, oblast or region of Russia called, um, called Kursk. These, um, it's also been announced in the last day or two that in Kursk alone, the, the Ukrainians have lost 10,000 killed and grievously wounded out of what was initially said to be 12,000 or maybe as many as 20,000 brought in. They also note that the Russians in the last month of accelerated movement um, in the, on the Donbass front lines have taken over or conquered or um, have liberated, depending on your point of view, whom you're rooting for, the 1,000 square kilometers of Ukrainian <clears throat> held territory in mostly in, in, in the Donetsk Oblast or re the Republic. The, um, that 1,000 square kilometers is roughly the same as what the Ukrainians have taken in Kursk. The difference being that the Ukrainian hold, hold on very, very uh, low population density region um, is, is um, very feeble. They, in order to hold that territory, they have to reinforce themselves. And that is precisely what the Russians are not allowing them to do. The Russians trying to chase down and kill all of these remaining um, platoons, mostly it's platoon level, because they're, they're, they're spread out thinly, not to provide big targets for, for Russian uh, glider bombs and so forth. Most of these platoons, they're in forests. It takes time to flush them out. After all, a thousand square kilometers is still a nice piece of territory if much of it is overgrown with, uh, with trees and bushes where you can be camouflaged. Um, but they, they need supplies, and they need reinforcements, they need rotation. And all of this is where the Russians are concentrating their firepower, both by, by their jets coming in and by artillery. I mean, the, exactly the border crossing area, um, 
which they are devastating. Therefore, the Ukrainian um, troops who are spread out over this territory in operating small groups are not being resupplied. And they are, uh, the situation is untenable. The, Russian, the Russians who have, who have just acquired um, through military uh, victories that are frankly fierce fighting um, in, in urban areas uh, of the, of the, the Donbass, um, they are, have, have fine logistical lines. They are resupplied and they are capable of moving where opportunity presents itself as the Ukrainians are unable to fill all the, all the points, all of the line of confrontation, given their, their losses in general and given specifically the loss of their most able and war-hardened and Western, Western-trained elite troops who were sent to Kursk uh, to fight and to die. Uh, for all of these reasons, the situation uh, for Ukraine is quite dire. And my colleagues were all very justified in expecting an outcome in the near future. Regrettably, the outcome is not what we had anticipated because we could not, we did not reckon on insanity. And it's precisely insanity that is governing the policymaking in Washington. We have two different attitudes right now. On one side, the Russian attitude that they're winning on the battlefield. At the same time, Shoigu is talking about negotiations. And he said that we have a variety of options for negotiations, but before going to the negotiating table, they have to withdraw their troops from the Russian territory. And on the other hand, we had a joint meeting of CIA and MI6. And after decades, which shows how important it was. And talking about two things, the conflict in Ukraine and the conflict in the Middle East. But when it comes to the to Ukraine, it doesn't seem that they're changing their mind. And you have a president, a, I don't know if we can call him president, President Zelensky in Ukraine, and he is willing to continue this conflict. And it seems to me that these people like Yermak and these far-right ultranationalists in Ukraine are running the show in Ukraine. And the United States is dealing with them, not with Zelensky. Do you think that these people are running the government in Ukraine or Zelensky is doing that just in contact with Washington? This is very difficult to call with precision. We don't have microphones under the pillows of any of these gentlemen. So it is we are all working on guesswork. Uh, I just think I, I try to be a bit more forthright and a bit more open with, with listeners or readers in saying what we know, what we don't know, and why I consider what we're saying to be educated guesses that are worth listening to, even if we are disproved because the basic assumptions have changed in unforeseeable ways because as I say, insanity is not a policy-making position that one can take take as 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 as, as the, the working uh, uh, material for for prognosticating. The um, who the Ukrainians individually, politicians have some agency. It is customary in the alternative media to speak of Ukraine as being puppets um, and as if they had no agency and no um, possibility of influencing the course. They do. That is, as a collective and as individuals. Therefore, you rightly point out the differences between uh, Yermak and, and Zelensky. And it remains an open question where American interf- uh, intervention favors one over another at a given moment and results in a policy course that we see. Mr. Zelensky himself has gone this way and that way, uh, week by week, on whether he wants negotiations or doesn't. Or doesn't. They're still talking about a November peace summit, which now they graciously want to invite the Russians to participate in. As for the Russians, yes, they also flip-flop. 
um, bef before he went to the to the Vladivostok uh, Eastern um, Economic Forum, Mr. Putin had ruled out entirely any possibility of negotiating with this regime in Kiev that had staged an incursion and an invasion of Russian territory in Kursk. That was a no-go. Uh, at the, at the, the forum, he changed his tune. And he was speaking of, yes, well, we can be quiet. Why did he change? Because I think he had intimations of what we've been talking about at the start of this program, that the United States was about to behave in an insane way. And he wanted it at all costs to, um, uh, to prevent that, uh, to uh, save the Americans from themselves and, and the world from, from impending destruction. And so, yes, uh, talks with the Ukrainians were back uh, on the list of possibilities, although with the qualifications that you just mentioned, first all troops have to be removed. Uh, now from Kursk, uh, I did not hear in Shoigu mention that all troops have to be withdrawn from the rest of the, um, the, uh, the Donbass, from the uh, Donetsk and, and Lugansk um, regions. So that seems to have moved into the background. Is that a softening of the Russian position? I would say so, but I believe it's only tactical. But anyone who thinks, anyone who doubts the firmness of the Russians and thinks that they are prepared to lose at the negotiating table, but they have won at, the, at a high cost in lives and treasure on the battlefield, I think they're misjudging. And there is a key issue. The misjudgment is taking place in Washington and in London. Um, others, including uh, the Germans and the French, are a bit more wary. They are, they are trying to protect themselves from a disastrous mistake of taking on Russia directly and, and, be, and uh, seeing their countries turn to ashes. Yeah. Here is a clip. Lloyd Austin is talking about Zelensky and the way they're trying to manage the situation in Ukraine. Um, well, thanks, Phil. I did get a chance to uh, to spend some uh, quality time with President Zelensky. And you'll recall that President Zelensky outlined his goals and objectives uh, during his opening comments. And I would point you to that to, um, if you have questions about specific objectives. But in terms of the plan for victory, Phil, we, uh, we didn't discuss that. Uh, that uh, uh, we, we talked about a number of things, but that in, uh, that specific piece we, we didn't discuss. And President Zelensky is going to present that to uh, President Biden and other leaders, uh, you know, uh, at the first opportunity. In, in terms of whether or not um, victory is achievable, um, again, I think this war could end very quickly if Mr. Putin decided to. Uh, pull his forces out of uh, uh, the places that he's occupied in Ukraine. I mean, this was started by by Putin. It could end. Uh, be, uh, Putin could end it uh, very quickly if he just made the simple and right decision to uh, to undo what what he's done. Uh, in terms of absolute victory, uh, it really depends on how you define that. Ukraine is is focused on defending its sovereign territory. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, to do everything we can to help them do that. Um, you know what Russia's goals and objectives are. You know I could speak to that specifically, and victory would be defined by goals and objectives. Uh, but I, we know from the very beginning that he's wanted to annex uh, Ukraine because he doesn't believe that Ukraine is a is a bona fide country. Um, I, I, I think uh, eventually uh, this this conflict will be uh, decided at a negotiate uh, uh, resolved at a negotiation table. Um, but uh... yeah, do you find it because when you look at the way that Lloyd Austin is pictured in this situation, he says that Russia withdraw the troops from the eastern part of Ukraine. Just go home. And it's it just pretend that nothing happened during more than two years. 700,000 soldiers were killed on the part of Ukrainians. 
all this battle on the part of Russians. We have a hundred thousand soldiers. But do they really understand what they're talking about? Well, I think you put your finger on the issue. I think, regrettably, we're, we are talking about people who are not delusional, but uh, but in, incredibly stupid. Um, I, th I would give them credit for, for more intelligence to say than they deserve to say they're delusional. Mr. Uh, Austin's remarks, I don't think that he is, um, uh, that he's lying. Uh, I think he believes what he said. And uh, that only speaks to, as I said, to, to stupidity that uh, ranks with, um, with uh, Annalena Verbock or any of the heroes on the, of Mr. Schultz's cabinet. This is regrettably abysmal level of intelligence. Um, now, let's, let me be clear about it. I'm not talking about IQ measurement. Maybe he has a high IQ. But they, the, the Americans have a very big mistake in taking IQ to be the unique and only definition of intelligence. Stupid is as stupid does. And everything that Mr. Austin is doing is rank stupid uh, in the sense of self-destructive and suicidal in the last analysis. Um, the, there's an old, old uh, folk, folk wisdom that you, know, you can, you can uh, fool the other guy, but don't fool yourself. And that is exactly what they have succeeded in doing because of a, 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 a lack of, uh, of knowledge of history, a lack of, of, of general knowledge. Uh, maybe he's very good at figuring out which end of the gun shoots, but uh, the big issues of, of um, military policy are way, uh, he's, they're way in, uh, out of his ballpark. And that is why we hear him saying these absurd things. Uh, I don't think he's a liar. I'm not questioning his his um, uh, sense of morality or uh, or his his um, his character. I'm questioning his brain. It isn't there, and so he's in good company or bad company with Mr. Blinken. Let us, let's just be clear about this. I want to go back to when Mr. Blinken was nominated by Biden uh, soon after his uh, November elections. Uh, in, in 2020, there were people who are who should know better, who are very politically smart, like the um, the owner publisher of the Nation magazine, who were ecstatic that a person who had grown up in France, who was bilingual, who had such international experience, such a good education, as Mr. Um, Blinken, was replacing this common slob. Uh, who had been the the, uh, the Secretary of State under under Trump? Well, my goodness, what a lack of judgment! And this is among the, the smartest, most sophisticated people in the Eastern establishment, and they thought highly of Blinken because they were looking at the wrong end of the stick. They didn't look at all of the horrible things to which Blinken had been a participant in his previous government service. So. Uh, as I say, there's no monopoly on, on stupidity, but where it does exist, fortunately not everywhere, it has to be called out for what it is, and not as a lack of character or, or a failure to score high, to score well on some standardized IQ test. No, no. Intelligence is, man, is, is proven by the demonstration of intelligence. Yeah. Do you think that when he's talking this way, he's not he was provided with wrong intelligence on the part of the intelligence community. That's why he's coming out with this wrong decisions oh, on his part. There you're coming to lies. This uh, meeting that was the Financial Times sponsored last weekend, in which uh, the MI6 and the CIA chiefs, Mr. Burns, um, held forth. Now, Mr. Burns, like another hero, of a lot of the liberal establishment, people who, who are sophisticated, um, worldly wise in Washington, and who thought highly of him. After all, he was the ambassador to, uh, uh, to Russia, who wrote, dispatched back 
uh, to Washington that net means net, that the, that the Russians do have red lines and we should not have uh, illusions about that. This is the same Mr. Burns who was spouting before the Financial Times audience complete lies and rubbish about Russia, its intentions, its culpability or lack of culpability in what is going on. Uh, he has no credibility and he, he is a man that is totally dishonored. And that is the head of the CIA. Um, what can you say? The American establishment, large parts of it, are rotten and are doing a tremendous disservice to the people who are paying their wages, the American public. Yeah, it seems that it's the same type of policy as we saw with Victoria Nuland, and she just resigned. And right now, we, it doesn't seem that they're changing their mind. That would be why, much why different. They, from why should they? Uh, to put to use American vernacular. There have been no consequences, no consequences. Oh, this is the one part of last night's debate that I listened to closely where Mr. Trump said, you didn't fire anybody. That's true. The people have committed egregious crimes or uh, they have caused tremendous hardship and harm to, to others um, through the, how American policy is, is managed and they pay no price for it. Uh, nobody paid a price for the, the awful withdrawal from Afghanistan. Nobody paid a price for any of the atrocities that the United States has committed uh, well, a less limited in time the last 20 years. Um, there has been no look in the rear view mirror. We, the neocons have, have dominated foreign policy and they don't look back at all of the horrors that have been committed by the United States on their recommendations. So uh, it, this, this is the, the present situation. Nothing is corrected, no lessons are learned, and we move from one disaster to the next. But the, the disaster before us now is of unprecedented proportions, both in the Middle East, where the United States is not just enabling, but encouraging an Israeli attack on Lebanon, which will unleash, uh, uh, take the genie from, from, from uh, the box, Pandora's box, we, of, of a regional war that can spill over into a world war at a moment's notice. Um, so that you've got this, this uh, tragedy in the making also in the next week or two or three. And you've got the situation with the, the, the possible use in that time period of long range missiles supplied by the Brits and maybe by the Americans to strike at, at um, what are, would be civilian targets because they're uh, in, in Russia, uh, which will precipitate a Russian response, which would precipitate most likely an American counter response that could be a, an intended nuclear strike on Russia. In your opinion, Russia is changing its policy in the Middle East. We learned yesterday, we learned that an Israeli F-16 was shot down by Syrian government and the way that the United States and Russia are behaving right now in the Middle East, what we can get from that? Well, Russia was very heavily invested in Syria from 2015 and it saved the um, Bashar Assad government from what would have been regime change it was very close to it. I think about 70 or 80 percent of Syrian territory was occupied by the insurgents, by the uh, Islamic extremists that have been receiving uh, assistance from the United States and its allies, particularly Britain, uh, for the sake of that overthrow. The, it was the direct military intervention, mostly air power uh, by, by Russia, but also the people on the ground who uh, went around uh, community to community to negotiate um, a settlement of the of the conflict um, of the insurgency against the, the Damascus government um, between the, the opposing sides. So on the ground and from the air, Russia was deeply invested in Syria. It has been a matter of surprise to some observers, and myself included, why Russia stepped back from that a heavy intervention 
and allowed Israel to uh, repeatedly violate Syrian airspace and bomb uh, targets which they identified as uh, supplies uh, going to Hezbollah uh, or Hamas passing through Syria from Iran. Well, it is, it is perplexing why the Russians did not provide sufficient air defense or uh, permissions for use of the air defense against the Israeli Air Force and these uh, bombing raids were allowed to proceed. Obviously, as you're suggesting, there is a change in Russian policy with respect to Israel. The, um, uh, the, there are many reasons for it, of course. Uh, the Gaza atrocities are um, uh, condemned in a full-throated way by the Russians, but they have taken no action. They've been, uh, obviously, their um, major attention has been on the Ukraine war. However, now the Ukraine war and the Middle East war in the making are linking up. The um, possibility or even the likelihood of an Israeli uh, invasion of Lebanon brings into play the neighborhood. Uh, neighborhood, as Alistair Crook was saying a day ago, meaning, meaning even though Jordanians are, uh, are very likely going to enter a military uh, operation against Israel, because of the atrocities that are being committed by Israel, not just in Gaza, but in the West Bank, where so many Jordanians have, have come from or have still have close relatives. This is intolerable to Jordanian society. And the Egyptians have their own reasons for entering uh, with respect to, to the border crossing violations uh, that Israel is, commit is committing um, with respect to border crossings from Sinai. And the Turkey has been very loud in condemning what the, the massacre of Palestinians and the intended destruction of Hamas, who are blood brothers uh, to, to uh, Mr. Erdogan's um, uh, religious um, and um, uh, uh, societies in, in Turkey. Um, and then you've got Syria, as you just mentioned, uh, who are willy-nilly uh, part of the part of any military operation that Israel undertakes in the region, because they are a transit route supplying the uh, the uh, this axis of resistance um, against Israeli oper operations. The Russians are based; they have their naval a naval base, which is mostly a refitting and resupply base for for their vessels in the Eastern Mediterranean. They have this in Tarsus. In, um, in Syria, they have an air base, and um, they cannot be for very long uh, silent observers when the whole region goes up in flames, as it may well do uh, if Israelis proceed with the instructions that Mr. Netanyahu gave to the IDF two days ago to, to proceed with a, an invasion of Lebanon. So the, these two fronts, What's going on in Ukraine, what's going on, or what's about to go on in, in the Middle East, bring Russia and the United States into direct uh, conflict. And that is why I, I'm saying that this is not a, um, a localized or regional um, uh, risk that we have, but genuinely a, a risk of, of a global world war. Yeah. We, we've learned that Saudi Arabia is opening its embassy in Damascus. And the other thing would ha, was the negotiations between Erdogan and the Syrian government. It wasn't go the way R R Russia wanted to be. But we, it seems that after the BRICS in Kazan, they're going to talk again with each other. But at the end of the day, we are witnessing how the problem between the Syrian government and the government in Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, is just fading away and they're getting closer to each other, which is the direct conclusion of the Russian policy in the Middle East. And in your opinion, is there any sort of understanding on the part of the United States about what's going on in the Middle East and what would be in the benefit of the United States 
in order to put some sort of, I don't know, end to the conflict in Gaza. Well, you, you, you just directed attention to the Russian policy as being a factor for change. I, I would put the emphasis and shine the light on US policy. I think it's the enabling of Israel to commit the atrocities, the provide provision of these two ton bombs, which, which accounted for the, the awful um, uh, murder of civilians uh, a day ago, and has been a major factor in, in loss of life and how it's gone to what, 41,000 civilians killed in, in Gaza. Um, and of course, as I just mentioned a moment ago, uh, repeating the words of uh, Alistair Crook, the, uh, the atrocities now being committed by Israel in the West Bank, all of these are enabled by the United States. And you have to um, con consider the dynamic, the impact of that, of America's participation in this uh, war on the Palestinians and on Islam uh, in the neighboring countries, which are all Islamic, and farther afield. We saw um, during, uh, by the, the, um, the guest appearance, the, the VIP guest appearance of the Prime Minister of Malaysia, which was quite, and who's also going to be in Kazan and, and is likely to be inducted into, into BRICS. Um, this was, what was this? Like, Malaysia is not Arab, but Malaysia is predominantly Islamic. And the United States policy on Israel and the atrocities has repulsed them to the point where they're changing their allegiances going against the United States and into the arms of Russia. So it is with what you described, the changes uh, in, in Turkish behavior towards Syria, in uh, Saudi Arabia behavior towards Syria, and the regional consolidation of countries that, uh, that are two different branches of Islam, uh, and uh, which are not terribly friendly uh, over the centuries with one another, but they overlook this because of the much greater challenge and offense they find in American behavior through its un unqualified, unlimited support for Israel as it commits crimes against humanity right in the midst of their neighborhood. Yeah. And getting back to the conflict in Ukraine, we had in Victoria Nula's in interview recently, and she was talking about the reason behind why they have decided not to negotiate with Russia. And let me play it for you. First told by former Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett that, that both sides were really close to the end, to the, to the successful end of the, of the negotiations. And then Prime Minister Boris Johnson interfered and stopped. Uh, Ukrainians prevented Ukrainians from from signing signing the deal, and then uh, Ukrainian representative Arahami kind of confirmed it. That yes, he said in a, in an interview that, that there was some kind of advice from Boris Johnson to uh, to stop ne negotiating and to win this war militarily. Where is the myth? Where where is the truth? Relatively late in the game, um, the Ukrainians began asking for advice uh, on where this thing was going. And it became clear to us, uh, clear to the Brits, clear to others, that Putin's main condition was buried in an annex uh, to this document that they were working on. Mm -hmm. And it included limits on the precise kinds of weapon systems that Ukraine could have after the deal, such that Ukraine would basically be neutered as a military force. And there were no similar constraints on Russia. Russia wasn't required to pull back. Russia wasn't, re wasn't required to have a buffer zone from the Ukrainian border, wasn't required to have the same constraints on its military facing Ukraine. Um, and so uh, people inside Ukraine and people outside Ukraine started asking questions about whether this was a good deal. And that was at that point that it, that it fell apart. Yeah. And do you, do you find the reason that she's given us, it's, it's unbelievable if that was the reason 
for what that they have decided not to negotiate with Russia just because of the range of weapons that they can use in Ukraine. Well, she she has a point, but the point is a cover. It's it's not directing attention to the real uh, uh, intentions of Mr. Johnson in coordination with the United States. Uh, the reasons for the advice, or I should say, the very strong advice, or the diktat from Johnson to to Zelensky, um, was that the United States wanted to continue to use. Ukraine as a battering ram against Russia to impose this strategic uh, defeat on, on Russia. And the possibility of a, what the Ukraine would look like after this was over, or um, uh, defending their rights to arm themselves as they saw fit, or protecting themselves, protecting Ukraine against designation as a neutral country, uh, all of these uh, points are, are just um, um, cover their irrelevancies actually for the the um, United States intervention with the hand of the Brits to prevent the conclusion of a treaty. I uh, this this addendum that she's talking about. Uh, yes, of course, it was understandable. It was uh, th this was mentioned in passing without specifics that the size of the of the Ukrainian military establishment would be fixed, that there would be no right to have foreign uh, foreign military structures or personnel in Ukraine, that it would become a neutral country in the sense that Austria and once upon a time Finland were neutral countries. That was unacceptable. But then the United States was not interested in the outcome of the war for Ukraine. The, the United States was only interested in the outcome of the war for Russia, <laughs> that for Russia would be destroyed. So that Russia would undergo a regime change and hopefully be broken up into 10 different countries, which could be easily swallowed and managed by the collective West. That was the objective. And that's what remains the objective to this day of American support for Ukraine. The Ukraine can be bled, bled dry. Ukraine can, can enter into a demographic uh, catastrophe because all able-bodied men will have been killed uh, on the battlefield, or in their, or in their, their um, uh, uh, training centers, or um, uh, barracks, that, that that is a matter of indifference to the United States leadership, and also to to NATO leadership. Their interest is only one country, getting rid of Russia. Yeah. Just to wrap up this session. I want to talk about Iran. We had a new president in Iran, and everybody was talking about if he go, if he's going to change the Iran's policy toward Russia. We've learned yesterday that Iran is sending missiles to Russia, and they're gonna sign a an agreement, a comprehensive agreement in Kazan in BRICS. How do you find? right now with the new president of Iran, the situation, the relationship between Iran and Russia, and how we can understand the response coming from NATO allies? Look, all these countries are at play. The fact that a, that a relative moderate um, was selected, elect, elected uh, as the successor president uh, in Iran um, was and his opening remarks that he was looking to improve relations with uh, with the West. That was a set of signals. However, uh, I don't think that um, he had a choice. Uh, the Iranian leadership had a choice. Let's keep in mind that there has always there has been split opinion in Iran, in which way they wanted to face. Um, did they want to face the East, or did they, Russia and China, or did they want to face West? And there always was, as was the case in Turkey, as is the case in India. These countries have, um, have, have split elites. They have elites that have been trained in the East and they have elites that have been trained in the West. And they, 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 they rock back and forth between favoring one or another as conditions change. Iran, obviously, seeing the gravity um, of the situation evolving on their... On the, uh, on their doorstep, seeing the likelihood of this, this Israeli invasion 
of, um, of Lebanon, which will necessarily um, bring Iran into the conflict uh, to defend um, uh, to defend uh, Hezbollah, and which will necessarily make them more reliant on assistance from Russia for air defense to counter the American jets that are now based on those aircraft carriers to, to uh, ward off any thoughts by Israel to use nuclear weapons against themselves. Um, that means that the, the uh, relationship between Iran and, and uh, Russia is consolidated. Uh, since I, I, I think you know, some of your audience may know that I'm a regular commentator on WEON, the Indian uh, commercial global broadcaster in English, I follow closely what I see on in some of their broadcasts that, that appear on YouTube. And uh, they, they also, they, I think, since they're close to the Indian government necessarily, with their large audience of 9 million subscribers, uh, they rock this way and that way. And uh, so when I first appeared on their show, their comments were, well, gee, how interesting that you, you let this guy on your show um, uh, who's giving a different view from, from the Washington narrative. And uh, some of the sometimes comments come up when uh, I think when Ukrainians get into the act and join the comment list that, my goodness, uh, Weon has become a sellout to Moscow. And now I'm looking at whom they're interviewing and they're interviewing Washington narrative people. So they go back and forth. And so it is, they, they are reacting to the situation they see around them. Um, uh, then the Russians are not stupid. They understand very well that they have a delicate balance with a country like India and not to um, outwear their welcome there or to expect too much by way of, uh, of friendship with, uh, when India is under enormous pressure from the United States. Uh, China uh, has done its best to stay in the good graces of the United States. But right now, with the threat of, of, a, of high tariffs and ever new sanctions for the alleged Chinese support of a military effort in Ukraine, China, China is, is left with little choice. But again, but to enter into what about Mr. Putin, um, I don't think inadvertently, I don't think he makes mistakes of this kind, called an alliance. We have um, the Chinese, for, the, for their whole existence, have avoided the term alliance with anybody. But I think it's about to materialize. So these are countries that are, for good reason, looking after their own interests and their own security. But because of the irresponsible, reckless behavior of the United States, are one by one being forced, being compelled by their self-interest and survival to draw closer to Russia. Yeah. Thank you so much, Gilbert, for being with us. The great pleasure to talk with you.